You're listening to WPRS on the Z Talk Radio Network. The next stop. The next stop is the Warren Exchange Paranormal Radio Show on the Z Talk Z Talk Radio Network. The views expressed and opinions given by the individual hosts and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Z Talk Radio, its affiliates, or sponsors. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. You are at the Warren Exchange. I'm your host, Al Warren. And with us tonight, filmmaker Johnny Clark. He is the creator of the 2013 documentary Dead Razor. And now he's the creator of the new series on Destination America Project Afterlife on the Sci Fi Network, Sundays at 10, 9 Central. We're going to talk to him about the new series and about his documentary, Dead Razor, right after these words. Subway's bringing the flavor with this new guacamole for a couple of reasons. First, people really love our guacamole. Rich and creamy made from Haas avocados and just a hint of jalapeno to keep it interesting. The other reason is, it's just really fun to say. Guacamole. 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 See? Come in and try our new guacamole on sandwiches like the Chipotle chicken melt and discover how it turns up the flavor on all your favorite sandwiches. Subway. Eat fresh. Hey everyone, my name is Tyler Oakley. I know y'all got crazy busy days. Honestly, the only way I can ever get through a crazy day is with some coffee. Thankfully, Starbucks has these brand new mini frappuccinos. Can we talk about how cute these are? That are the perfect size. Whether you are just starting your crazy day or you're halfway through and you need that pick-me-up, they are ideal. Actually, adorable. I know, we have all been there where you're trying to decide between two flavors, and honestly, how can you pick between perfection and perfection? Well, now you can get two without feeling guilty. I know. You're welcome in advance. You can listen to us anytime, anywhere now. Download our free app now for the iPhone and iPad. Look for the Warren Exchange or House of Mystery app at the Apple App Store today. I'm gonna die. 
three demons. They just came out of my heart laughing. We got them. I was getting a preview of heaven and hell. Actually, when you die, it's almost like getting the burden off your shoulder. There are those who say they have visited the afterlife, challenging our understanding of death, motivated by their own experiences pulling victims back from the grave. Four investigators now seek to solve the mysteries of resurrection. This is going to help unlock something that hasn't been known for thousands of years. Regardless of religion, the person was dead and they came back to life. We're pursuing this to show that the impossible is in fact possible. Death doesn't really have the final say so. Why did you defy the odds? This is Project Afterlife. We're back. Joining us, filmmaker Johnny Clark. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. Hey, you bet, Warren. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's a pleasure. Um, so, so for everybody listening, let's start out with uh, who Johnny Clark is, like who you are and kind of how you got to do what you're doing. Sure. Well, I set out um, in 2012 to make a film, uh, to make a documentary film about people who had died and come back to life, uh, mainly through... Uh, prayer and people uh, laying hands on them and seeing them come back to life. And probably like you're thinking, that sounds uh, crazy. That's That was kind of my take as well. I had just started hearing enough of these stories that sounded similar um, to want to look into them deeper. So my wife and I moved to Boulder, Colorado and we didn't know anybody there. Uh, we had no plans other than we wanted to make a film about this. And we wanted to find these people. And when we set out, it, it was very, um, we didn't have a lot of direction other than knowing this is what we're going to do. And we didn't know how we were going to do it. We'd never done it before. Can I, can I just ask, what, what made you choose Boulder, Colorado? Yeah. Well, it's really interesting. Honestly, all I can say is that uh, it must have been a divine being or something speaking to me and my wife because we had never been there uh, other than we had driven through the Rocky Mountain National Park and kind of driven through Boulder uh, as you kind of make your way uh, through the front range there. But other than that, we'd never, we didn't know anything about it. And so I came home from work one day uh, we were living in Madison, Wisconsin, and I told my wife, uh, Nicole, I've been thinking about Boulder, you know, you know, almost the whole week, and I was expecting her to just say, oh, great, but instead, she looked at me kind of perplexed and said, that's really strange. All day, I was thinking about Boulder, and we just kind of looked at each other for a moment, and didn't know what to do. Uh, so we ended up kind of talking to friends, talking to family, saying, wow, I don't know why we're, why we're sensing this, but you know, they all encouraged us, Hey, go, you know, do, do what you need to do. We were, so we were very fortunate that way. So we ended up going and that whole getting there and everything was, uh, was a, a real journey of, uh, of stepping out, uh, you know, to, to go after what we were trying to pursue. So, once we got there, to kind of show you how things unraveled, we had been there about 24 hours, and we showed up to this public um, service that was happening on like a Saturday night. Um, again, we didn't know anyone. We, we hardly knew where, you know, to get groceries. We ended up going, and the first thing this, this man stands up and says is, oh, we're so excited. Everybody's here tonight we've already seen two people raised from the dead this year. And we just looked at each other and kind of smiled and, and were concerned and happy all at the same time because here we were. And this is the first thing we're hearing after going to this place uh, that we knew nothing about. So that, <laughs> that kind of started that the whole journey. And so, so, but did, that didn't make you feel kind of, offset you know you weren't a little bit uh, nervous about that uh, about moving absolutely 
Yeah, because I mean that's like you gave up your whole life um, in Madison and moved to um, Boulder. I mean that's pretty pretty brave, right? Because you give up, you know, you're basically moving away from friends and family, people around you, uh, jobs, life, everything, to a different part of the country. Isn't that? Uh, I mean that's pretty. I mean that's brave. I think that's great that you would do that for something you really sought out. Um, but it must have been scary a little bit. It was. It was very uh, nerve-wracking. I mean, you have to understand, we didn't know anyone there. Like, we had no connections. We had no friends. We had no family. We had nothing. We didn't even have a place to live. We loaded up two SUVs, and a buddy uh, drove one that was completely full into the front seat, and I drove the other one. We gave everything else away. So, I mean, we were... Uh, we had a two-year-old and a three-month-old at the time, okay? Wow. Uh, and we just said, if we're doing this, we're doing it. So uh, what is it that you were trying to do? I mean, what was in your mind? Like, okay, so here I am with two two sp- fairly um, small children, wife, and I'm just kind of giving away things and taking what I need, and I'm moving to Colorado. So w- what is it I'm moving there for? Like, what, So I'm just trying to get in your mindset of what you were thinking you were looking for or trying to achieve? We were going to make a film about resurrection. That's all we knew. Okay. That's it. I mean, there really was not a a, a game plan. There wasn't, uh, you know, money. There wasn't people. It was just we felt like we had to go there to do this. And that's what we did. Wow. That's great. I mean, I'm, I'm that's wonderful. You really believed in what you were doing. So... Wow. Okay. So now you get to Colorado. You heard this this um, service on the Saturday, and they were saying, you know, they've just raised two people. And so that kind of confirmed you being there. It did. It made us feel like we weren't completely crazy. Um, and from there, we, we kind of calmed down a little bit. Uh, we made a plan to say, okay, if we're going to make a film, we should probably figure out how to do that. And we did. Uh, we really got set. I mean, the whole Dead Razor was all just my wife and I. We didn't have any other help. We we ran a Kickstarter campaign. Um, we we thought, well, let's raise some money to just pay for getting around. Uh, so we went. Our goal was to raise twenty thousand dollars, and we ended up raising forty over forty thousand um, dollars for this. And it, it blew us away. We thought, wow, there's people out there that, you know, are also interested in this. So that was really great. It was almost this instant community of people that were supporting us that we honestly mostly had never met. And that, again, was a, a boost of encouragement. I connected with some wonderful uh, business mentors and people in Boulder who offered some great advice on maybe how to how to take this around and what to think about. So very fortunate there. And we did it. We set out. We found these people with these stories. I just started talking to everyone I knew. Here's what we're doing. Here's what we're doing. If you, you know, if you hear of anything, let us know. If you know of anybody with a story like this, you know, let us know. Because we could use Google, right? Yeah. But we could find very little. Uh, we could we could find pieces of stories or people who had referenced certain things, but then we had to go find them. So through doing that, just by talking about what we were doing, things began to come to us. People began to call say, Hey, you know, I found this manuscript. Hey, this person has a story. Um, Cause even with the advent of, you know, search engines and optimizing stories, in 2012, it wasn't what it was today. So even if someone did have a book or something had been covered um, on the news, it was pretty challenging for us to track down all of those cases. And even today, it still is. We depend on people to send us things. So you think the mainstream media, this isn't something that gets covered a lot, is what you're saying? No, not that we've seen. And and for good reason. I think the the news syndicates want to protect uh, the validity of 
of the stories they're covering, which is completely understandable. Um, because when we're talking about resurrection, um, you know, people coming back from the dead isn't something uh, that you hear about all of the time. So, you know, is this someone just making a claim? Is this a doctor who made a mistake? Is this uh, somebody just trying to make something up for some kind of financial gain? Um, you know, and we had to navigate all of those things too. So I think the media has largely kind of stayed out of it. But our goal was just to go and find as many of these stories as we could and present them to people, you know, in, a, you know, in, in an entertaining uh, kind of way. Right, right. So now, when, so when you were um, starting to film Dead Racer, did you have experience filmmaking before? Like, were you taking it in college, or were you sort of doing other films, or uh, where where did that come from? As actually making a film, did you kind of know how to do that? No, I've always been interested in the technical side of things. Uh, right out of high school, I started a recording studio, a commercial recording studio, and I went to school for electrical engineering. And my thought process in that was, uh, I'm going to go into the. I come from a long line of, of of collegiate scholars, and you know, my grandfather was a nuclear engineer and all this kind of stuff. And I thought, okay, well, we'll give that a try. And at the same time, we'll go into business, you know, working on the creative end. And I figured by the end of this, I'll know maybe which path I like better and so about three years into it i the studio was going great and i just discovered my love of story and story specifically in in sonics and and music i just loved uh what we could do and the emotion that came from telling wonderful stories and so from that uh a few years later i found video and all of a sudden, now we can marry, uh, we can marry sound and picture. I mean, it was just. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it sounds very basic, right? No, but, but it's, I know what you mean. It has come a long way. It's just it's amazing. Come, it's come a long way, and so I had never made a feature length. I, you know, the longest things I had made were, uh, you know, shorter, shorter videos and and things like that. So, but I love the technical aspects, and I studied those you know, on my own for many years with just all of it. And with my background in in sound, I kind of had a leg up in trying to to capture, you know, good a good quality product. Yeah. And that's 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 great. And so how long did it take you to put together the documentary, first of all? Like how much how much how many years or how much work, how much what, what was the process like uh in that? I would say at the very end of 2011 is when I first had the idea of making a documentary film on something about resurrection. Uh, Then in 2012 is when we ended up moving to Colorado, and that was um, in May. And we really got started and we really got tooled after we'd kind of done some of the research um, in January of 2013. So the film really got made, uh, the film released in October of 2013. We went around uh, for the whole month of October, and the film actually premiered in over 75 cities around the world. Um, That must have been pretty exciting. It was very exciting. And we got to see how, you know, just taking an idea, focusing on it, making a plan and acting on it uh, can really change your life. Okay. So now um, let's, let's talk a little bit about um, your history. So people know that where you come from. Um, So where did you, you grew up in Madison, Wisconsin? Yep. I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, and I went to school here, grew up here. My parents were ministers at a church in Madison and uh, I, I got to grow up. I got to grow up hearing these uh, amazing stories of, of people out on the quote-unquote mission field, and you know, 
near chances at, at, at death and seeing people um, be healed and all manner of things. So I, I grew up as a young boy around the dinner table hearing all these things. And I think from a young age, just uh, ever since I can remember, I would be sitting around the, the kitchen table listening to people uh, who would who'd be coming in and out and sharing and asking questions and and uh, I think that that definitely has played a role in in what I'm doing now. Right now, now so what's your what's your thought on um, afterlife? As in, um, uh, you know, like the, the the ghost hunting teams and the shows and uh, a lot of the uh, focus on communicating with spirits that have passed. Yeah, I think we're all navigating that. And I don't have any hard and fast answers other than, you know, we need to listen to each other. We need to figure out what's going on and try to connect the dots, you know, try to make as much sense of it as we can. Yeah. Now, on, now, now, and you, now how did you get into Destination America? All right. Well, that takes us to the next leg of the relay race. <laughs> which was after we finished the film, we kind of had this moment where we realized we had accomplished kind of what we set out to do. The, the tour was done. Uh, many people had seen the film. That We were successful. And it was a sobering moment in our lives where we, you know, who accomplishes the dream they set out to achieve, right? Right. Um, and we just kind of told ourselves, well, what's next? Like, where can we take this next? I mean, we need to dream bigger. So we said, well, how do we get this on television? Because what we just did was a lot of work. And uh, even for, you know, tens of thousands of people to see a movie was incredibly challenging. So how can we get this message out to more people? So we looked into television and it was clear you know, one showing of an episode, even on cable television, can reach far more people than us doing it by ourselves. And so we said, okay, if we're going to do TV, it's either New York or Los Angeles. So again, we we moved to Los Angeles with, without knowing anyone. It was pretty much a replica of what we'd done in Boulder. We went to L.A. But that's a huge move. I mean, L.A. is not like Boulder. <laughs> no, it's not. It was it was really crazy. I mean, just getting used to the uh, the density, uh, the population density was overwhelming to say the least. Oh yeah. But we just knew. Well, let's go, and so we went. And within three weeks of moving to Los Angeles, we had um, almost a dozen production companies call us and say. We think we can turn Dead Razor into a into a television series, and uh, we kind of said, "Well, okay, um, how do we do this?" And we ended up, you know, talking to all of them and hearing kind of what they had to say. And we ended up connecting with a wonderful company in Seattle, uh, and they're the production company Screaming Flea Productions, which is run by Dave Severson up there, and. We hit it off right away. They're one of their. They've done television for the last twenty five years and been very successful. But one of the shows uh, that probably a lot of people know that they do is called Hoarders. Mm, yeah. Um, and we love what they do with that, um, and really how they help people. Um, and so we said, all right, you know, we can we can do that. They treated us wonderfully. They walked us through uh, what they would do, and we said, all right, let's do it. Let's Give it a try, and here we are today with uh, what what ended up coming out as Project Afterlife on Destination America, and uh, yeah, that's kind of how that happened. Yeah. Now, how do you um, so on these episodes? Like I've, I've seen, um, how did you decide on what you're going to show? So, like when you get um, information on people that have um, died and have been brought back 
Um, how do you select which one you're going to focus on? Sure. So with these cases, um, and one of the wonderful things about Los Angeles is there are amazing um, entertainment master storytellers. And so it's kind of their job to figure out, you know, how can we present this information uh, in the clearest way? And so we got to work with, with some amazing people. And we, we ended up um, coming to, and when I say we, I mean, you know, the network executives and the production company executives and the showrunner and all of the pieces that we had in front of us. And we really came up with, okay, uh, these stories of people who've had an afterlife experience are something where we can begin to connect the, connect the dots. And so what we were able to bring to the table was, you know, here's all of our research. Here are dozens of cases of real people that we can talk to, that we can read about, that this has happened to. And so from that, you kind of have to look and say, okay, if we're going to create a series, um, what is the, the focus? And so that's where kind of Project Afterlife came from. Here's people who've had this experience of resurrection and and – They've experienced something on the other side that they can remember. Because even in our research, sometimes there's a miraculous case of someone coming back, but they maybe didn't have an afterlife experience. So through that, um, we really discovered, hey, there's something here of people who remember or have a recollection of something that happened in the afterlife. And we all loved it. We said, this is great. Um, and not only that, but it, it makes way um, through entertainment to be able to show some of these things, to be able to, um, you know, visually get into the story, which we loved. Because um, kind of one of my philosophies is, you know, the best story wins. And these are ama- all of these are amazing stories. But specifically when we're talking about the afterlife, um, it's kind of a no holds barred reality that we've entered because somebody isn't trying to convince us that what they saw was real. We're more interested in just tell us what you saw and let's see if that matches up with all of these other things that other people saw. Um, So it's kind of less about us proving about what someone's saying is true and trying to find the stories that seem authentic and then finding other stories that we can find uh, that really help us paint a bigger picture as to what might be going on in the afterlife. So you know, how do you determine, like when you were talking about uh, people that have died, um, what at what point do you think death begins then? That is an excellent question. And this is one we've had to, we go over a, a lot. And, uh, you know, the, the medical uh, definition of death is, you know, when you aren't breathing, your heart's not beating, and you have no brain activity. So, okay, if those are the three things that determine death medically, then, then those are kind of the standards um, by which we can say someone died. Now, what it doesn't cover is how long those things happen, right? So some people, skeptics, like to say, well, they weren't dead long enough. Um, So to that, we kind of say, well, what is long enough? Um, Is one minute considered death? Is, you know, 10 days considered death? Um, And that's kind of something that we would love to have a better definition of, uh, it's not that we're trying to make the rules for that. We're just trying to say, hey, if someone's been dead for five minutes, is that just as dead as them? Is that just as uh, accurate as them being dead for several hours or several days? Because we found stories where people have been dead for five minutes, you know, uh, pronounced dead. And then we've had stories where people have been dead for three days. Wow, and, we, and we've even heard claims of up to a week, and um, yeah. Well, is that kind of what's the longest 
someone's been dead that they've been able to return to life that you know of that I know of I would have to say uh, one week one week that's a long time now doesn't d didn't didn't their body sort of deteriorate from not being alive yes so how does that work when you get resurrected so I've been dead a week I'm a little bit stiff <laughs> and um, I come back to life now now am, am I as I was before yes yeah, so the the one of the big issues in the medical community um, that we completely understand and uh, respect is that if you you know there's you can resuscitate someone but sometimes it's not always in the best interest physically to to do that in you know we're speaking of of doctors you know if someone's been without oxygen for um you know over 5 minutes and specifically when it gets in like to the 12 minute range there will be permanent brain damage, you know, and, and we don't go against science. We're not trying to disprove science. We, you know, I think faith and science marry perfectly together and we need to look at both, but we need to be smart about it and we need to, you know, respect one another in the things that science has been able to uncover. And so I think everyone would agree, hey, if if we're going to bring this person back and they're going to have no brain activity um, and and be in, in tremendous pain or anything like that. I don't know that that's um, a, a great service yeah. <laughs> that, we're, that we're doing to people. And so we, we get that. We understand that. So with these cases, it's almost as if something has happened, something has um, – divinely shifted or they've heard a voice or they've felt something and these people be it a doctor or a family member or a, a passerby they've done something or heard something and reacted so they've they've laid a hand on they've said a prayer they've commanded someone to come back to life and then that's when in most of these cases that's when something miraculous has ended up taking place and so when you were talking, you, you mentioned the medical and stuff like that and going through records. What, um, what, what's, what's kind of the response or the reactions you get when you're doing uh, research or you're finding a, a case that, you know, there's been some sort of death pronounced and they've come back? How, how, is, how is the science side, the medical side, react to your research? Well, I want to work with these people. I want to work with the with the medical community because I think they're seeing things that are very hard and challenging for them to talk about. And that's why we have a lot of respect for people like Chauncey Crandall, who, you know, he's a world-renowned cardiologist. Uh, he's spent his life studying science and medicine and the best application for his patients. And for him to have an experience where he hears a voice tell him to turn around and pray for a man that he just pronounced dead, that's a big deal. And obviously, he's put himself on the line even by talking about that. Um, you know, scrutiny, all kinds of scrutiny and skepticism and other things. Um, but if that's happening to him, then the chances are that that's happened to someone else. And I feel like as a filmmaker, as an investigator, it's my job to go find out what's happening. And it's not my job to to judge these people. Right. It's my job to listen and find out what happened. Because as soon as people hear these stories, it might, it might create in them uh, – a desire to want to share maybe something that happened with them and they might be holding a real key to something and if they don't share it based on fear that's just not right so we you know we encourage people to run from fear we run from fear as as much as we can and 
you know, if, if we can rid ourselves of that, uh, I think we can get a long way for yeah. humanity. Oh, yeah. Now, that, that, that was your premiere episode, which came on um, Sunday, August 9th, and um, with Dr. Chauncey Crandall. Um, do you want to explain kind of what that was that happened in that show? Sure. So Jeff Markin is experiencing chest pain. He drives himself to an ER. And as he's telling them that he's having a significant pain in his chest, he falls over on the floor and has a massive heart attack. The ER doctors come in and take Jeff uh, into uh, the, the ER room and they begin working on him, they begin shocking him, they begin doing chest compressions, everything that they're trained to do, they did. They, uh, the medical doctor, the ER doctor, pages Chauncey Crandall, who is, in the, who is in the hospital doing his rounds for the day. Chauncey, we need you to get down here. Chauncey comes. Um, by the time he gets there, they've been working on Jeff, who's been unresponsive for 45 minutes. They call the time of death. Um, and that's it. They say, we've done everything we can do. This, you know, that's it. And they, they do these things every day. So it's not like this was, oh my gosh, this happens, you know, once a year. This is, you know, a, a daily thing. So they all leave. The nurse begins preparing his body for the morgue. As Chauncey's leaving, he hears a voice tell him, turn around and pray for that man. And Chauncey kind of stops in his tracks and... He's debating, like, what is this voice? Is this myself? Is this God? What's going on here? So he decides, you know what? I'm just going to ignore it. I have a lot to do today. He continues going on, and he hears this voice again. Turn around and pray for that man. So he decides, okay, twice is enough. So he turns around, goes back into the room. The nurse is, you know, getting his body all prepared and he walks over and he said he placed his hand on Jeff's chest and he looked up to the ceiling and just simply said, okay, God, I don't know how to pray for a dead man. This, I don't know what, what I'm even doing here, but God, if he didn't know you, then I pray that you would bring him back to life. And all of a sudden, uh, he, he saw some movement. And from that movement, the doctor came back in, the ER doctor came back in and said, what are you doing? He said, I think we need to shock him one more time. And they said, we can't do that. You know, that's not part of our procedure. He said, do it for me. They said, well, you know, he's going to be brain dead. They went through all this and they finally said, okay, we'll, we'll do it. And so they shocked him and Jeff Markin ended up you know, sitting up and coming back to life. Now, you have to understand, he already had cyanosis setting in. That's where, you know, your your blood settles uh, to the lowest point of your body. So the blackness was had already set in, and he had been unresponsive. Um, that whole, I mean, they, <laughs> they pronounced him dead. And Chauncey said that the, the nurse screamed, oh, my gosh, what have you done? What's happening? And his response was none of them really understood what was happening. And so now, were you able to uh, talk to the doctor at all and find out, like, what his view, views were? Like, when he when he was putting the hand on and that, so was he thinking of a certain god, or did was he religious, I guess is what I'm saying. Did he have kind of a background in something? Yeah, so Chauncey... Uh, grew up and is a, a, a devout Christian, and he he believes in the power of prayer. Uh, you know, I, I, he prays regularly, and he had just never uh, thought, you know, he could pray for the dead. Hmm. So that was something new, and obviously in our studies. Um, the Bible has ten resurrection stories of, you know, people who were dead, who came back to life at 10. You know, and obviously Jesus, uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. Um, so, you know, I in all these studies we see, you know, there's one point something billion Christians on the planet. Well, 
if that's the case, then why are we just now talking about resurrection, right? Because from Jesus' own mouth, he said, heal the sick and raise the dead. Um, so if that was his instructions to his followers, then why aren't we seeing more of that? And so uh, that's something that's really driven me. If if those words are in fact true, if the Bible is in fact something that we can depend upon, uh, then we should be seeing that uh, you, we should be seeing the, the dead be raised. I mean, that's just all there is to it. Right. Well, then what chooses who gets resurrected or, or like, and I'm not, I'm not saying that selectively. Like, I mean, just like what, what creates the scenario where this happened? Like with this Dr. Chauncey, uh, what happened to make that scenario happen when there's, you know, probably thousands in the hospital for different things like heart attacks and, strokes and stuff that they die what makes that one happen like it, it do, do, do you know you sort of know what i mean yes um my blanket statement for that would be i don't know but i do have a theory uh, that i can share with you warren yeah. and in all of the cases in all of these cases it seems to me that compassion plays a huge role Someone stopped for a moment out of their day and thought about someone else, and they went and did something about it. Um, in every case in the Bible, that's, that's the case. Um, in, I would say, almost in every case that we've seen where, where there have been two people involved, uh, that has been the case. When I say two people, I mean someone who was dead and someone who went to do something. And I don't even think that that person who goes maybe even thinks they're going to raise somebody from the dead. They just simply go out of a a love, out of a longing, out of, you know, hearing a voice or whatever it is. And they stop what they're doing and they go focus on someone else and they tell them to get up or they tell them to come back or they ask God to bring them back or they, Tell them their time isn't done yet. And something miraculous happens. And that seems to be a recurring theme. I don't know if, you know, obviously we all want our loved ones around us. And, you know, death is a painful thing. But in these cases, that seems to be a common, you know, a commonality. Hmm. And what do you think is happening um, to create this resurrection, like what? Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but if 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 there someone prays, put their hands on the body, and wants them back, and they come back, is is there a medical process that happens? It's, it's, it's a hard question. That's kind of weird. Um, uh, no, I, I I hear you. I hear what you're saying, and you know I. I don't know. The only thing I do know is the more people we can talk to, we can kind of maybe begin to connect these these dots. And I don't know what happens when life returns or 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 when life goes, but something happens, right? Um, some people see lights. Um, science has a few, you know, great explanations for why that might be happening. Um, and those are fascinating. And I, but you know, when the, when life comes back into a person, you know, we've heard cases where, um, you know, DNA has been changed in a person's blood. Um, we have found cases where there was tremendous pain felt. We've heard cases of people being uh, healed of ailments that they were facing upon coming back. And all of that is significant. And I think in some of these shows, uh, in the show you'll see this Sunday, um, some of these individuals uh, were not enjoying life. And something happened in the afterlife that made them realize, uh, 
the opportunity that they have to be alive. And now they live, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I would use the word fuller, but I would say, I think there's just more of an appreciation for life. And I think that's beautiful. I think if something happens to us where we have a new perspective on life or we can appreciate the value of life, uh, something really beautiful happens and that affects us as individuals and it affects those around us. So ultimately, you know, these stories are beautiful because of the emphasis it, it puts on life. Now, have you um, talked to people that have been resurrected and kind of about what their experiences are when they were dead? Yes. And this is a big part about, uh, this is a big part of what Project Afterlife is all about. We're really finding out, okay, what happened in that, in those moments or hours when you were dead? What do you remember? And people are sharing some incredible stuff with us. Um, and sometimes this is, you know, the first they've shared um, because they felt uncomfortable sharing these things. And obviously with a show on television, I mean, you're really sharing it with, with the world when you're doing that. And so I commend these people for, uh, for doing that. Um, but yeah, we've heard cases of, of people having, you know, glorious, heavenly, peaceful experiences. And we've also heard the exact opposite of people seeing nothing, people feeling like they were stuck or like they were going to hell. Um, this, on this last Sunday's episode, um, you know, both of these individuals felt like they were entering hell. I mean, it's the best way we can describe that. And uh, that makes me as uncomfortable as it does everyone else. You know, why, why would they see that and someone else be in a peaceful bed of flowers? I don't know. I mean, I, I really don't know. Um, I have my own theories about um, hell and things like that and I don't always enjoy hearing those things like I said with fear uh, I, I try to sprint from, from fear as fast as I can but even in that we have to listen to what these people are telling us and these two individuals on Sunday Theo Nez and Arthur Veal uh, one died of a drug overdose and the other was you know for lack of a better word kind of a hustler you know a pimp and where they were was not a happy place for them. And in, in both cases, there were people praying, uh, telling them to come back to life. And these people were begging God for a second chance for these, these two men. And they got to come back. And as a result of them coming back, uh, they changed their life. Which again is is beautiful, but <laughs> I don't always think that something like that needs to happen for people to get the most out of life. But in these cases, that is what happened, and uh, you know, and they they were describing to us uh, Sheol, which we learned from Roger, is one of the investigators, is uh, described in the Bible as this waiting place from the wicked and the righteous, and. Arthur didn't know anything about, you know, the biblical definition of Sheol, um, but he was almost explaining it to a T. And we think those kinds of things are fascinating to find. Um, and, you know, and when people are using it in their native uh, explanations, it's much more interesting than if someone's just trying to rail off something they read somewhere. Right, yeah. Now, now, have you had experiences? What happens when um, someone that, like an atheist, for instance, someone that just has no belief, um, have you had any experiences studying that where they've been resurrected and what they experienced? Is it sort of similar or is it different? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, with with someone who, you know, maybe doesn't believe there's an, an afterlife or... Or, or God, um, I think it's wonderful to hear from from people from that perspective. Um, 
because usually it doesn't carry with it a bunch of baggage of preconceived ideas. Uh, and so hearing from them, again, we've heard the gamut. You know, they saw something peaceful and beautiful. They saw nothing. They saw, you know, damnation. It really, it, it, it's the spectrum. And some people come back and say, that, you know, there's nothing. I didn't see anything. And others come back saying, you know, I saw, fa I saw deceased family members. I saw my best friend. I saw my mother. I saw my dad. I saw Jesus. Um, I saw Jesus as a woman. I saw angels. I saw huge, beautiful lights and clouds. I mean, there's really no boundaries. And everyone usually at some point when they're talking to us likes to say, I really don't have a way to describe this, but, and that's when I know we're, we're really getting into something, you know, maybe we'll be able to create a vocabulary uh, for some of these things. And I think that would be wonderful. Hmm. What, what do you think the most shocking story that you've come across? The one that sticks out the most for you? That's probably a better way of putting it. Well, this isn't a verified story, but I'll share it with you um, because, to me, I I have to I have to uncover it. Um, the individual has said they they don't want to go public with this, but I'll share it with you. Um, a man in Indonesia was going around telling people uh, about the gospel. He was you know proselytizing and um, telling people about his faith, and as we know, parts of Indonesia can be uh, kind of a, a militant, uh, there are some militant Muslim areas, and they said, you need to stop this, you know, this isn't something that we condone, we can't allow you to continue, uh, and they pretty much gave him an ultimatum, either you stop and leave, or we kill you, and he said, I, I can't stop, and so they said, okay, well, we will kill you, and so they cut his head off, they beheaded him, and they threw his body as a display uh, on one side of the road and his head on the other. Uh, several hours passed, and a family uh, that was going into the town was walking on this scene, and they saw this uh, grotesque display, and the father of the family said, you know, no matter what we believe, like this isn't right. Like nobody deserves this. And so again, it's that act of compassion. He put, took the head and he walked to the other side of the road just to put the head near the body. And as he kind of set it, lobbed it down, <laughs> Uh, it reattached itself to the man's shoulders and he stood up and he said, thank you. Like your act of compassion has brought me back from the dead. Will you help me go find the men that did this so that we can show them of the tremendous love of God? Uh, as you can imagine, everybody was interested in finding out what happened there. Uh, the man was able to tell them he ended up leaving obviously, but uh, from what I from what I know, this this man uh, is alive, and he has a massive scar around his entire neck, where uh, apparently that happened. But I can't really explain to you what that is or what that even means. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And um, so with all that going on in the world today, what do you think, you know, with the, you're saying the resurrections and stuff, what do you think's going on in the world? Like with all the, you know, violence and terrorism and stuff and um, the, the fight with different religions now, um, do, do you have an opinion on it? Is the world getting better, you think, or? Okay. Well, again, you know, these are the age-old questions yeah. um, that, that far more intelligent people have answered. But I would say we get to choose the perspective we want to see life from. 
and we can either make that a positive perspective or a negative one. And I'm someone who wants to to choose a positive outlook. And I think personally, religion in a lot of ways has done a great disservice uh, to people by creating a tremendous fears that that people aren't going to live up to what they should or that they're going to end up in a terrible place when they die. And I think that cripples mankind when they sit around thinking about um, what they're doing wrong. And, of course, we get criticized all of the time for this work, and and that's okay. Uh, when we started, we had to we had to muscle past that um, and just decide, you know, there's something deeper here. And if we can bring the world closer to asking questions and finding the answers that, uh, you know, might be different than the ones they're looking for, then we're doing humanity a great service. Yeah. And you're always going to get the uh, negative, uh, you know, just always. Um, so I think it's just something you, you do what you believe in and, and uh, move it forward. Um, it's just there's, there's really nothing you can do about all that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you can't let it affect you. It does, I know, because I'll get it at times myself. But you can't. You just have to do. I mean, if you think you're doing what you need to do, then you've got to keep doing it. Like, it's not, uh, you know, don't let them sway you. Um, uh, what what about your your team now? You've got how many members are um, behind this? I know there's several, but do you, um, who's the main members of your team? Sure. So on uh, when we did Dead Razor, we we really I really wanted to make this not like a person or a singular group. Uh, more of the fact that this ability to resurrect and be resurrected is inside all of us. Um, but with Project Afterlife, uh, the team of investigators um, are myself, uh, Roger Freivalt, Jesse Berkey, who is a firefighter paramedic, and Sam Wagner, who was a Marine and was a uh, highway state patrolman who had his own experience uh, seeing a little boy uh, come back from the dead when he pulled over to the side of the road. And so the four of us are, are kind of the, the main investigators of Project Afterlife, where we're going and talking to these people on camera and sharing their stories with the world. That's great. So uh, now uh, how, you've got six episodes airing. Um, now you are airing on Sunday nights, right? Yes. So Project Afterlife uh, premieres uh, Sunday nights at 10 o'clock Eastern on Destination America. And I do commend Destination America for letting us share these stories. I think they're showing tremendous bravery in uh, allowing this on their program. And they've been amazing. I only have good things to say. And, uh, yeah, check it out. It's, it's really fun. We're halfway through, so there's three episodes now. If you miss those, um, you know, you can, you can catch those on Destination America or watch them on Amazon Prime or on iTunes. And I would definitely encourage people to do that. Right. Yeah, it's, it's very good. Um, now, uh, how about if people want to get in contact or they want to pass on some information about something they've heard or some sort of uh, death and resurrection or anything like that. How do they get a hold of you? Sure. So you can visit deadraiser.com. You can watch the film uh, for free with the, with the code Project Afterlife. And uh, if you have a story you'd like to share, you can find us on Twitter. And you can find me on Twitter at Johnny C. Tweet. And I will we'll post a link to a form, just a really basic Google Docs form that you can fill out with your name and your email and you can either type your story or create a video and send it to us. Uh, but we would love to hear from people. Absolutely. If you have a story of 
uh, you know, a, a death experience or something that happened on the other side, you know, we would we would love to hear from you. Fantastic. Well, um, it's been an interesting hour. Um, I could go on forever, but they won't air it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Warren. I mean, you're you're doing a great work. And if there's ever any way I can help you, or if you find stories, man, I'd I'd love to continue the conversation with you. Oh, fantastic! We'd we'd love to have you back again, and uh, and uh, keep up the good work, and uh, we'll 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 talk to you again. Okay, thanks, Warren. How do you? Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of the Z Talk Radio Network. I'll be back.